be talking about the evolution of graphics on 6502 based microprocessor systems. And it's truly amazing how many years that that processor has endured. In fact, in 2020, there are devices being made with 6502s in them. And there's an entire company called Western Design Center that still sells 6502s for a variety of applications. That's really impressive, the legacy of that, of that processor. So of course, the 6502 was designed by Chuck Peddle. Uh, he originally worked for Motorola, and then he split off and formed his own company called MOS. And that is the basis for all of these machines. The first machine we're going to talk about here is sitting right in front of me here. It's a Commodore PET. This particular model is a PET 4032-12. It is, it is a later PET, but we're going to start and we're going to talk about as if this was 1977. So in 1977, there was a trifecta of personal computers that came out to make personal computing really realistic for home users. We had the Commodore PET, which is actually the last in 77 to come out. And we have the machine I'll talk about next, which is the Apple II sitting right next to it. And then we also have the TRS-80 Model 1. So there's some really amazing things. So since we're talking about graphics, we'll show what is possible and how that evolved over time. So on the PET, as you can see, we're actually showing here, we're showing a demo of a, a new game that will be coming out uh, later this year or early next year. I'm not sure exactly which. Uh, it's by a, a guy, a YouTuber you may familiar with called the 8-Bit Guy. Uh, it's called Pesky Robots. It is showing character graphics on the 6502. And that's what these pets were capable of. There was no graphics hardware in them whatsoever. They did have video RAM for storage of what was going to be outputted on the screen, but there's no graphics hardware. But it does show, if you look at this system, that you can move around and it's, it's pretty impressive the capability and how fluid you can be without any sort of graphics hardware whatsoever. So it shows what the capability of the systems are. It also shows that there's still interest in these 6502 systems and pushing the limits on them in 2020, which is truly amazing. The next system we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about the original Apple II. There probably aren't too many more directly influential microcomputers. Um, this machine has had enormous sales, uh, maybe not quite so many as, as the Commodore 64. There's always that discussion of what was the best-selling microcomputer of all time. And there's, depending on the metric, there's all kinds of different arguments, just like everything in history. But this is, this is an original model Apple II. It is a later version. The original versions wouldn't have had these slots in the case, and the keyboard is slightly different. And this one, of course, has been slightly modified over the years as parts failed. But this is an original Apple II, and we're showing on it is a game you're going to see repeated across a lot of our machines. This is Defender. So we're showing Defender on various systems so you can directly compare. When you compare the graphics on the Apple II to the PET, you'll see, first of all, it does have graphics. Um, the Apple II has a really interesting graphics setup where um, the layout in RAM for the graphics is a little odd. And the reason it was laid out the way it was by Steve Wozniak is because by having the graphics memory arranged the way it is within main RAM, you could both eliminate the dedicated graphics memory that the PET had, and also you could refresh the dynamic random access memory, or DRAM, without extra chips, just by having the screen layout being the way it is in RAM. So it makes for a really fascinating system. If you compare this, you'll see even without, there's no sprites, um, which we'll talk about a little bit what a sprite is when we get to a computer that has one. This system has no sprites, has no uh, hardware movement of graphics. It just relies on you know, off-screen buffering and what, a technique called racing the beam or updating when things are not in use and not displayed. But you can see we can have fairly wide moving display items. We can have things move clearly. We have some fairly sharp and color graphics. The other interesting thing is there's no dedicated color circuitry in this Apple II. It uses a technique called artifact graphics, which is pretty darn amazing. Uh, again, to keep the part count down, because things like RAM and chips, the ICs that run the system, were astonishingly expensive in 1977 and 1976 when these were actually designed. But to keep the part count down, they use a technique called artifact color, which is a, a NTSC, or, or our national television standard uh, in the United States and, and some other countries. But it, it's, it's an after effect of how the system works. And that's how the system generates color. And you may notice there's only certain colors in use on the screen. 
and only certain colors can be generated on certain positions in the screen. That makes for a very unique color layout, and games like Defender here, you can see actually, you can get some very bright, colorful, and changing layouts, and you can see in the ship as it moves, there's detailed color on it, and the reason those colors have to change as the ship moves from place to place, but if you do it well, like Atari Soft did when writing this game for the Apple II, you can see how it makes the system look more detailed. So, over to my co-presenter here, Jonathan Sturgis. Yep. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. So, next up in this uh, evolution of 6502 graphics, we go to the venerable uh, Atari uh, video computer system, or otherwise known as the 2600, uh, first introduced in uh, 1979, and uh, probably well known to almost everyone. Um, it, so in 79 had the uh, innovation compared with the previous two units of actually having five sprites. Um, and uh, this, this, this is kind of a big advancement in, in gameplay because it uh, allows that well, allows you to write better games, allows you to have uh, objects moving around the screen um, without having to do a complete redraw of the screen. Um, th uh, this machine, obviously, for it's, it's still by obviously by modern terms kind of kind of limited. I, one of the biggest um, interesting, I think, limitations on this machine was that it had um, only 128 bytes of RAM, and so it didn't even have um, so so the. Uh, Yes, uh, so, so uh, going back to where uh, we were a few minutes ago, so the Atari 2600 um, followed um, uh, the PET and the uh, Apple II in 1979, um, and it was a, uh, probably one of the most, uh, most recognizable and most popular game consoles of the, of the uh, early 80s, for sure. Um, it had some unique, unique characteristics compared to um, the previous two machines. Um, it had a lot less RAM, uh, only 128 bytes of RAM, but it, but it was able to display 128 colors on the on the uh, NTSC version, so that was impressive for its time. It also had five sprites, um, which does uh, allow you to write more um, uh, more more advanced games, basically, um, having objects moving on the screen and um, not having to do a full rewrite of the screen um, allows you to. Uh, have things that interact with each other a little better. So it had some, some advantages. Um, uh, the um, resolution still not, you know, we're still talking, um, uh, you know, early, um, early 80s, we're still talking about analog, most people, you know, hooking, the, hooking up to a, a TV at home, so low resolution stuff. Um, 160 by 192 pixels on the VCS, um, and that's with trick, that's with a little bit of trickery, that's if you kind of max out all the, um, the, the play field and the sprite pixels and kind of get creative there. But um, in the end, very good, a lot of very good game ports. Defender was a good one. Um, in some ways, it, in some ways um, you, you see it side by side with the Apple II. Um, while the, uh, there's aspects of the Apple II that, that, look, um, that look pretty good. The Apple II's port is pretty good. The, you can see, one of the things you can see on the um, VCS version is the, uh, the scrolling is much smoother and, and, and much faster, so that's pretty cool. So it did, did allow for uh, uh, Defender to be a really good, really good game on that platform. Um, and then, so following following the, the VCS in 1979, we're going to move up in time um, down to the Vic, the Commodore Vic 20. Um, well, not, um, uh, so introduced 1980, um, it was an inexpensive home computer, uh, about introduction, introduction price of uh, $300, uh, launch price of $300. And while not intended to um, complete, compete, or be a dedicated game uh, console, it certainly had uh, very good game capabilities. It was kind of a, targeted to be a low cost uh, game, a game and education machine for home use, um, and then some, you know, maybe some home finance or something on the side. But it turned out to be a pretty popular game machine. Um, did not have any sprites. Um, did take a step back in colors relative to the VCS. Only had um, 16 possible colors, um, but uh, had a lot more RAM. It, it came with a, a kind of an odd number. It came with 5K of RAM by default. 
only about three and a half of that is usable. Uh, but then it was extendable through uh, RAM expansion on cartridges up to, uh, up to 40K in some cases. And so what that also allowed, um, actually I kind of forgot to touch on that on the, on the, on the Atari. So um, the Atari cartridges were much smaller and typically maxed out around four kilobytes. Um, there were a couple I think that with some trickery could, could maybe go to 64K. Um, and um, so, so here uh, it was also quite common on the VIC to, uh, for games that needed to add some additional RAM on the cartridge with the, with the game. Um, we were again to compare Defender. Um, so um, the uh, Defender port here also uh, does tend to look pretty good. Um, the uh, scrolling is not quite as smooth as the VCS, but um, but the uh, but the colors are pretty good. Um, platform pretty good. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say about it? I guess that's some kind of the key stuff. Um, Alex, do you want to Yeah, the only other comment that I'll add on the VIC-20 is that uh, going back to another system here that, well, as you can see, the graphics are fairly impressive. There's actually no dedicated graphics hardware per se for sprites or anything like that. There's a chip, in, it's called, where the system gets its name, called the VIC, um, and that's what generates the output. But it's not really doing graphics, it's, it's mostly doing, it's effectively, it's a, a modified form, you can change the character set to be whatever you want, um, but yeah, it doesn't have a, any sort of bitmap graphics capability, but it shows what you can really do with that. Yeah, thank you, that was a point I meant to make, is that it's not, not a fully addressable screen, and that was, uh, that, that's something you find later on is quite common, and we expect, of course, but uh, in the early days, yeah, it didn't quite, didn't quite get there. Okay, so. well, uh, next machine we're going to move on to right next to the VIC-20. We're jumping a f uh, ahead a few years to 1983. So Atari, actually fairly early on, came out with their own competitor uh, same, uh, about the same time as the VIC-20. A little bit, uh, They had the Atari 400 and the Atari 800. Um, this Atari 800 XL that you see right here is a couple years later from 1983, and it's a, uh, it's a redesign for significant cost savings, but it also adds a ton of capability. It has 64K RAM, so it's the most RAM we've seen in any of these systems, but it inherits a capability from the Atari 400 and 800 in the fact that it actually has dedicated graphics hardware. It, depending on the version, it either has a chip in the early systems called the CTIA or Television Interface Adapter, um, this system has what's called a GTIA, or a Graphic Television Interface Adapter. Um, in addition to those capabilities, uh, it, it gives it the ability to do advanced sprites. And you actually have eight sprites on screen at one time. You also have dedicated sound in a chip called the Pokey, which was also available in the uh, Atari uh, video game console line, depending on the video game console. But you also hear it in a ton of arcade games made by Atari Soft. And it, it's a pretty amazing graphics chip. It can, uh, it has very flexible, has several voices. I'm sorry, sound chip. But um, anyway, as you can see, comparing the 800 to what you saw from the VCS and what you saw in the VIC-20, you see significantly higher resolution graphics here. Um, so you have a maximum resolution of 384 by 192 uh, with 256 colors. Um, so again, you have a much more colorful palette and as I said, eight sprites. And, and you have a, a little bit of a faster system too, because um, the main processor is still 6502, this, in this case 6502B, but it's al almost twice as fast at 1.79 megahertz. Uh, it's a significant difference, and again, with the dedicated graphics chip, it means you could do a heck of a lot with this system. Um, these systems were a lot more powerful and a lot more flexible than they quite often get credit for. Uh, a lot of people saw them as just, oh, the, you know, the 800 is just an Atari 2600 with a keyboard. There's a ton more capability with that, and there's been modern expansions and modern upgrades. You know, there are a couple of them sitting here. We're not really talking about them in this, but this is uh, effectively an Atari floppy drive on a Raspberry Pi that's sitting here attached to it. Um, but it's a system. So this, this is the device I was talking about here. So it's, it's called an S-Drive Max, and it allows you to store a ton of Atari software. And it, it looks very much like a cartridge, and it sort of is designed to look like that. So anyway, there's a ton of different uh, software available for the Atari. And if we have time at the end of the stream, we'll show some more capabilities on it. But for the moment, we're actually going to move on to our next system.
uh, which is uh, back to my compatriot Jonathan Sturgis yep. here for the Nintendo Entertainment System. All right, so another, another uh, you probably saw it earlier in the, in the video uh, stream next to the Atari, but the Nintendo NES is the later NES with the, uh, uh, the vertical cartridge um, slot. Uh, another extremely popular uh, worldwide game system um, in the States was introduced in about 1985. Um, it has the same speed 6502 as the uh, Atari 800, so 1.79 megahertz. Um, only 2K of onboard RAM, um, 48 color palette, 25 of which can be used um, without any trickery um, at the same time. A uh, little more resolution than the uh, VCS, uh, so 250-something uh, by 240 uh, pixels, and an impressive uh, uh, 64 sprites, so that's a, that's a huge improvement. Um, uh, definitely adding a lot, to, a lot of flexibility there for uh, game development. Um, so then there is... Uh, Original Defender is not available for this platform, but there's a Defender 2, um, and you can see, you can clearly see this looks way more advanced than the uh, other Defenders we've seen so far today. Um, the uh, sharpness of the of the of the uh, uh, of the fighter and the uh, all the and the aliens, uh, the colors are great. The scrolling is incredibly smooth. Very very nice. Very very nice port. Um, and. Uh, makes a really good use of this of this uh, of the system and so then this had a very long life uh, the Famicom version of this which was the Japanese one um, launched two years earlier in Japan so in 83 and then I think ran until like 2003 so it had an incredibly long lifespan so that's that's an incredible uh, run for a single uh, uh, little 8 bit chip like the 6502 um, and I think that's it. Yeah, uh, I'll add a note yeah. that, uh, yeah, the, the processor in this, it, it is a 6502, but in this case it was made by Rico. It is called the Rico 2A03. It's a very similar speed chip to what was present in the Atari 800. Um, the, it's uh, just met fab by someone else, as the 6502 has been. It's been made by many other companies throughout its lifespan. Um, but uh, yeah, we have slightly lower resolution than the Atari 800. We have 256 by 240. But um, an interesting palette of 48 maximum colors, but there were 64 possible sprites. So our next system we're going to move to, I'm going to have to switch the TV real quick and switch the input on it. We're going to talk about the TurboGrafx-16. Let's see if I can do this from behind. I got it. Actually, I'm pretty good at it if you want me to do it. Okay. Actually, I think I got it. HDMI uh, 1. Yeah. HDMI one there, so it should be moving. Yep, okay. there we go. So in here uh, uh, is another modern port. Again, the original version of Defender was never available on the TurboGrafx-16. We're going to show a game that came out in 2014 called Atlantean. But again, it's it's Defender. It's a modern take on Defender and showing what it's capable of doing in this hardware. Uh, so the TurboGrafx-16 came out originally in. Uh, in Japan in 1980, late 1985, I believe. It was called the PC Engine. So it was a very powerful system, but it, it was late in its introduction into the US market, which is why the, uh, our viewers, if we have any in Japan, will be much more familiar and in Europe with the system. Um, it, in Europe, it was the core graphics, uh, but uh, the PC Engine, uh, actually, even though it called itself, and again, in the US, it called itself the TurboGrafx-16, that really only uh, applies to the graphics processors. It's not a true 16-bit system. Again, this is a 65 over 2 based system. In this case, it's the Hudson C6280, which is a 6502 with some added capability added on. So it, it's kind of a system on chip, if you want to think about it that way. Um, for game console, it's had a ton of RAM. It's had 64K of RAM, and it's a fairly fast 6502 at uh, 7 megahertz. So, a uh, pretty capable system. Uh, and again, the resolution on this, getting into more technical details, we have 565 by 242. And really, you're limited there by NTSC. That's really the limitation on this system, rather than what it was capable of doing. It was capable of the same 64 sprites as the NES. 
But you'll see, looking at the system and some of the other games, if anyone's familiar with the launch, there was a game called Bonk's Revenge that was launch title in the US. It's very large, uh, colorful sprites, and it supported more colors than the same sprite than the NES does, showing the evolution on 6502 graphics systems. So, very large sprites there, and you can have a sprite size of up to 32 by 64 pixels. That's a very big sprite, and they were quite colorful. We're running a little bit short on time, so we're going to jump ahead to our last system here. We're going to jump ahead to another system by Atari, the Atari Lynx. Yep, so our, our last um, 6502 machine in the uh, display today is the Atari Lynx, a uh, handheld 6502 introduced in, um, in 1989. And um, by my personal estimation, a pretty capable machine, although it never seemed to garnish, garnish the market share necessary to really be uh, successful for a long time. Sorry about this, guys. And then, uh, thank you. That should have done it. <laughs> Please pardon oh, our, Yeah, okay. So, um, so the Atari Lynx uh, introduced in 1989 uh, as a, uh, uh, the, uh, I, I believe the first handheld gaming platform based on the 6502, it had a 4 megahertz 6502, 64K of RAM, and had 4,096 colors, and ran off of uh, six AA batteries or, a, or an AC adapter. Um, for its time, there's no, you know, no wireless uh, technology or so forth, in, but it did have a, uh, uh, um, what did they call it, uh, it, it but it, I forget what they called it, but a Lynx, a uh, multi had uh, a cable. You could interconnect two Lynx units and play head to head, which is kind of cool for the time too. So um, yeah, so the so no Defender for this machine, but there's a a Defender-ish game called Gates of Zendikon. Do we need to let's see, let's reboot this, and then we'll get it, launch a game of it. But um, you can see really quickly what the um, how uh, what what the uh, some of the advanced material. The, uh, some of the, um, the scrolling is great. Uh, we're not really showing off audio today, but this game's got pretty good sound effects. Um, and uh, let's see here. Let's see if we can get a game going here. Here we go. All right. This is our bad guy. <laughs> he's so dropping. Right this is the mother brain from Metroid. Yeah, he drops, a, he drops a bunch of eyeballs for some reason. All right, all right. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to play this uh, upside Another down. Another interesting note about the Lynx is the fact that even though it's marketed as an Atari, it was actually designed by uh, a famous video game software company called Epix, is the handy. And uh, they just didn't have the money to, uh, to develop the system, so they ended up selling it to Atari, so it finally came cool. out. And it took a while to come out because of that sort of development. Um, and you can see an interesting effect here is, as Jonathan's playing, you'll see that the sprite has changed. Because of the, the capability for so many sprites in the system, it's actually modifying that main player's sprite, the, the ship, as it gets hit. You lose some pieces off of it and before finally being destroyed. And you see that big colorful explosion. Yeah. It's a pretty impressive uh, graphical technique. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to play far enough into the game to show you some of the additional levels today. <laughs> but. Uh, but it is, this, this game is quite impressive, actually. Yeah, and it really does show that 6502 really is a flexible CPU. Yeah. And again, there's modern versions of 6502 available that are uh, up to 33 megahertz. So that's, that's a really impressive system. So especially considering that the 6502 is a fully static microprocessor, means it can be fully halted and continued during execution, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So truly amazing system. Why don't we come to the last thing I'll just show, since we're running a little bit over time, and just show a couple things from, since I didn't really get to show you movement in this uh, pet game called Petsky Robots. Uh, again, showing what's capable, the hardware is capable, even if development wasn't. If you see, we actually have moving water here, which is pretty impressive that this is all going in the background. And again, this is a fairly slow machine with no graphics capability, but we can move very smoothly. Um, we have animated, and again, as I run into the trees, but uh, we have animated doors. So it, it's pretty darn impressive. And if I'd seen this on a pet, when I first saw a pet when I was in elementary school, I, I would have been just blown away. Yeah. You can do things, we can interact with objects. I can, uh, I can search for something. I can, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can look around. I, can, I, can, I have a weapon here. Uh, I can shoot in any direction I'd like to go. We got, we got a so it, it's really amazing. So keep an eye on that. And thanks again to the 8-Bit guy, David Murray, 
for, uh, for allowing us to show this. All right. And thanks so much to everyone for their attention during this presentation. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We're, you know, it's a learning experience for everybody. Uh, COVID makes everything more difficult than it otherwise would be. But we're still glad to be able to talk to you about all these great systems. And uh, keep your eye on 6502. Well, thanks, guys, very much for showing us uh, everything today. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, we're sorry if we had some uh, technical difficulties. I guarantee you it worked on the developer's desk. Um, but, you know, we were, did want to have some time for questions, but unfortunately we're running a little bit too far behind. If you send your questions into Discord, we'll try and answer them back on email, or if you email um, microphone at bcfed.org, we'll answer them electronically later. Yep. Um, right now we're going to uh, run over and we'll take a look at uh, FujiNet, um, and I think that's uh, Thomas Cherry Holmes. So.